Thank you everyone for coming. This is uh, John Raymond. I'm at uh, Laboratoire d'Astrophysique de Bordeaux. <laughs> As you can see, I learned a lot of French when I was out there with him last fall. Um, John got his PhD at Washington, where he's notorious from everyone else I've talked to is at Washington with him at the same time. Uh, undisputed beach ball champion of the <laughs> Washington physics and astronomy department. Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, Matt. Can you guys hear me okay? I think, I think the mic's working. Okay, good. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time at DTM. It seems like a great place. So uh, I'm going to tell you guys today about some kind of thinking about planet formation. And I'm going to take the point of view, the very high-level kind of story arc point of view. So we won't go into a ton of the nitty-gritty details, although you're free to, to ask about that. We'll kind of try to put the formation of the solar system in, in the context of something a little bigger. See, like, what specific events had to happen for our solar system to end up like this, whereas most of the exoplanet systems we see look like that. So here we go. So here's a little cartoon of our solar system. We got eight planets, four little rocky ones close in, big ones further out. You know, we all know and love the solar system. Now we can do the, the kind of thought experiment of if the solar system was observed as an exoplanet system with present day technology, what would we find? And with a, you know, with a survey of at least 10 or 20 years long in radial velocity, what you'd find is this. This is what the exosolar system looks like. We could find Jupiter because of its, you know, its radial velocity amplitude is big enough to be detected, but it has a long period, so you need to stare at the sun for a long time. And we could measure something about Jupiter's mass, something about its orbital period, its orbital size, and its orbital eccentricity. But that's it. You wouldn't see any of the other planets. It's very unlikely that you'd find any of the other planets with present day technology. So trying to put the solar system in context really is just putting the Sun-Jupiter system in context for now. Right? We're going towards finding the other planets, of course. But for now, that's where we're at. So one way to slice up the demographics of exoplanets is through this lens of Sun-Jupiter systems. So, so let me guide you through this, uh, this plot. So what we're doing here, starting from sun-like stars, the thickness of this line represents the relative occurrence. So starting from 100% you know, of sun-like stars, you can ask the question, well, what fraction of those stars have Jupiter mass companions, or Jupiter size companions? And the fraction is about 10%, ballpark. Okay? About 90% of them don't. A large fraction of those that don't uh, have systems that look very different than ours, systems of super-Earths or mini-Neptunes, planets that are a little bit bigger than Earth on orbits that are much closer in. Uh, then if we keep going down this branch, you can ask the question, well, what fraction of Jupiter mass companions have Jupiter-like orbits? And exactly how you define this will determine the numbers you know, in detail. But if you define orbits, you know, Jupiter's orbit to be relatively wide, wider than a certain distance, and more circular than a certain distance, having an eccentricity lower than, say, 10%, then the fraction of those Jupiter mass planets that have Jupiter-like orbits is only about 10%. Most, you know, most of those kind of planets have orbits that are either very stretched out, very eccentric, or closer in. And so just by slicing things up in this kind of simple way, the Sun-Jupiter system, our exosolar system, is already in the minority of about 1%. About 1% of suns seem like they might have this kind of So, so, so the biases are, the biases are, are taken out to, I mean, they're, they're attempted to be accounted for here. So, so there's uncertainties in terms of the long period Jupiters, but there's some, some good handle on those now. So, so, you know, this kind of number, maybe it's not 10%, maybe it's 15%, but it's not off by a factor of three. And so the goal here, kind of the overarching goal of, of recent studies of planet formation is to try to take this exoplanet observed demographics kind of map and turn it into a planet formation kind of map. And so using different processes of planet formation, things like planetesimal formation, pebble accretion, 
giant impacts, orbital migration, gas accretion, to explain how you end up with the same kind of diversity in planetary systems from a formation point of view. And so that's, that's where we're going in this talk. And we're going to try to figure out like these branching points, what determines them, and so what kind of steers things towards one type of planetary system or another. So, so starting off, kind of the, the general, simple, generic starting conditions for, for planet formation, we think, are the disks of gas and dust around young stars. And the gas drifts within the disk, sorry, the dust drifts within the gas disk and can pile up in certain areas and undergo hydrodynamical instabilities like the streaming instability. This is a simulation of the streaming instability. And anytime the color gets really light there, it is where there's a significant concentration of dust that can be concentrated enough to basically form gravitationally bound aggregates that form planetesimals. And this is the current paradigm for how planetesimals form. This has been a big improvement in, uh, in planet formation over the past 10, 20 years, is understanding how we think macroscopic, 100 kilometer scale planetesimals form. The next phase of, planet of, of planetary growth is kind of starting from planetesimals. They can collide with each other, and they can also keep accumulating this drifting dust or these drifting pebbles. And so you've probably heard, maybe you've heard the words pebble accretion. The word pebble is often interpreted just to mean the size range of objects that drift really fast within the gas disk. Okay, and that's determined by a thing called the Stokes number. But in practice, it's the size scale of things that drift really fast within the disk. And it's typically, you know, grain of sand size to centimeter size, something like that. And so it's typically called pebbles. And pebble accretion, what, what it does, it's, it's very powerful in terms of uh, a large planetesimals can accrete pebbles very efficiently. And so what happens is, if this is a large planetesimal, say a, a few hundred kilometer size planetesimal, uh, if another smaller planetesimal comes by, it'll just be gravitationally deflected, but because of gas drag, much smaller objects like pebbles can end up spiraling in and falling onto the growing planetesimal and feeding it. And pebble accretion can be very efficient and grow objects very quickly, at least within a certain mass range. So what does that do in the context of a whole disk? Well, starting, assuming planetesimals form throughout this disk, then pebble accretion will help these things grow farther, you know, grow, grow bigger. And so pebbles, we think they kind of, there's a flux of pebbles moving in through the disk from further out as dust grows, and it can help things get bigger. And a key factor here is that pebble accretion seems to be more efficient past the snow line. And why is that? It's probably because pebbles are a little bit bigger. And it's very sensitive to the size of these objects. They're more like centimeter size out past the snow line and more like millimeter size interior to the snow line. And just this small difference in size is a big difference in efficiency of growth, such that planetesimals that start off here, by, by the time planetesimals inside the snow line grow to something like the mass of Mars, Objects that are past the snow line have grown to five or 10 Earth masses. And so this is, this is kind of a nice picture because it reflects what you can imagine anyway as the starting conditions for the formation of the solar system. We got small rocky things in here and big planets out there. And so this kind of process we think is relatively generic. Right? There's a lot of details. You know, maybe planetesimals don't form everywhere at the same time. Maybe the pebble properties are a little bit off. But this general picture seems pretty generic, and it, it seems to explain a lot of things. So let's go from there. So now let's go back to this diagram and take this branching point here. So we'll, we'll assume that no gas giant planet is forming. So what happens next? Well, a lot of systems with no gas giants, not all of them, but a lot of them have super-Earths. And so here by super-Earths, I mean any planet that's, say, up to Neptune in size, so between one and four Earth radii. Uh, on orbits that are typically closer in than Mercury's uh, to their star. And so here's just a few example super-Earth systems. Uh, they often come in multiple systems. And you can see that what you're seeing here is, is the orbital period on a log scale. And you can see a lot of these things are pretty close to each other. The solar system is shown at the bottom for scale. And so the main difference between the solar system and these systems is the solar system's planets are further away. We don't have any super-Earths in the solar system, of course. And but otherwise, you know, they're a little smaller than most of them, just because the bigger ones are easier to find. But if you look at the distances between planets, that represents basically the period ratio, since it's a log scale. And if you look at the, you know, the period ratio between Venus and Earth, 
it's kind of similar to the period ratios between these, these super error systems. So from that point of view, they're not that weird. Right? But there's a lot of these things. There, you know, maybe half or a third of all sun-like stars have these super earth systems. And a key constraint on how they form is the period ratio distribution. So what is that? It's any time there's more than one planet in a system, you take the period ratio of adjacent planets, and you throw them in a bucket, and you see what you get. And this is that distribution. This is a cumulative distribution. And well, what, it, what does this mean, right? It's just a, a kind of a curvy line. It's hard to look at this and get much out of it. So, so the way I like to interpret this is not, what, what matters here is not what this plot looks like. It's what it doesn't look like. It does not look like this. Right? It doesn't look like a staircase. If you imagine, if all of these super systems were in orbital resonances, then you'd end up with this staircase shape. So imagine if half of all super Earth pairs were in three to two resonance and half were in two to one resonance, then this is what that distribution would look like. And that's not what it looks like. So, so that's important to know. So let's think about how these planets might form. They're really close into their stars. So maybe they just form locally where they are, you know, by collisional growth. So, so let's, let's look at that a little bit. If they just form locally by collisional growth, well, what does that process look like? So here's a very simple experiment where we chucked a bunch of planetary embryos and planetesimals kind of in the same region of parameter space, of orbital distance space, as one particular system of super Earths, just to see what happens. And so you'll see the evolution of this, uh, of this simulation. We're seeing orbital eccentricity versus semi-major axis. And so there's kind of this wave of growth that sweeps outward. And the, the key take home point here is that the growth is really fast. Within you know, a few thousand years, within 100,000 years, these planets are many Earth masses. You know, within 1,000 years, they were already roughly an Earth mass, the closest in one. And you can see their final masses there. So basically, the, the growth is really, really fast. But remember, this is happening within a gas disk. So, so here, we've not thought about migration or anything like that. Uh, should we be thinking about that? And the answer is, of course we should. Right? So, so here's what, what I've done here is shown the, the migration time scale of a bunch of Kepler planets, Kepler supers, where each dot is a very simple estimate of how fast migration should happen uh, for that planet, right? Just with very simple assumptions about what the gas disk may have looked like. And what you can see is these numbers are really small. They're like, you know, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 years. It's, uh, it's basically an exponential thing, so they move like kind of half the distance. And so, so it's, you know, these are very, they, these could easily move up or down a little bit based on the, the exact numbers, but clearly these are, are very low compared to estimates of the lifetime of disks. So it seems like these planets, if they form where they are, they must form really, really fast, and so that means that they must also migrate. So, so what does that mean? It means they didn't just form where they are. It doesn't mean that they, had to come in from 10 AU, but you can't ignore the process of migration. So the idea that they form in situ, with, and you can ignore migration in the process, that, that's not possible. So basically, because of these time scales, things happening so fast, growing fast enough, and the disk you know, being present, all roads here have to lead to migration. No matter how objects or their precursors grew, at, late, you know, at least late in the game, they have to migrate. And so what does migration look like anyway? So, so the process of migration, you know, in, in very simple terms, is a gravitational interaction between large planets and the gaseous disk. And here's a, a hydrodynamical simulation of five planets embedded in a gas disk. Each of these dots is a three Earth mass planet embedded in a disk. And you can see they launch all these spiral density waves within the disk. They also create density perturbations along their orbits. And these density perturbations torque the planet's orbit and can cause the orbits to either grow or shrink. So usually to shrink, but not in all cases. And migration is important for planets that are more massive than roughly Earth or so. And the more massive planets migrate faster. So that's kind of a very simple uh, idea of migration. And one final ingredient here is it's important to realize that plants are not going to grow and just all just fall onto their stars. And the reason for that is that we think that disks have inner edges. And these inner edges act as migration traps. And so a planet that forms out here might migrate inward fast, 
but it can't just fall on the star. So it'll get stuck at the inner edge of the disk. There's a strong torque that counterbalances it, and it gets trapped there. So, so let's kind of put these kind of simple ingredients together uh, and see what, see what we got. So starting from these planetary embryos that have formed by a process of planetesimals forming, pebbles grabbing onto planetesimals, uh, there's a distribution of planetary embryos. And what should they do next? Well, we think they should migrate inward. The big guys should migrate in faster. The large ones, the migrating ones, are probably those ones that formed a little further out. And what happens is they, they don't just end up merging into one large body. They tend to end up in chains of orbital resonances. These are kind of little stable islands for the adjacent planets. And this is a pretty generic outcome. Anytime there's migration with an edge where things are getting squished together, the planets end up in resonance. And it's not like they magically go there and just stack up immediately. Sometimes these resonant chains break, there's collisions, but then as long as the gas is still there, they put themselves back into resonant chains. And the kind of resonances you find are these kind of resonances. It's not always these ones, these are just examples. And you can see, you know, sometimes there's planets that form that are red, that are made mostly out of rocky things, although most of them tend to be water rich in this kind of model. But, you know, these, the, the disk is what's driven this migration, what's putting things in resonant chains. And the disk, I, can, I like to think of it as the, um, it's like the teacher on the playground at recess. So as soon as the teacher, while the teacher's there, the kids, well, they don't do anything too dumb, hopefully. But then as soon as the teacher goes away, things, they go crazy. Right? I, this, is, this is how it goes. Right? So, and the gas just dissipates after a few million years. And these systems usually go unstable and have a late phase of collisions that tend to spread out their systems and remove them from resonances. And in terms of the period ratio distribution I was showing you before, you know, this is our kind of not that interesting distribution. Now here in red is the distribution of resonant chains that we get from, from a series of simulations. And so, so now we, there, basically it is following this kind of staircase pattern. There's a lot of planets in that resonance, whichever one that is, you know, four to three or three to two, something like that. You can see. And then after the chains go unstable, and there's this phase of collisions, systems are much more spread out. And so they follow this blue distribution. And so in very simple terms, it's easy to match the observed distribution by a combination of these two. And everything fits really nicely if most systems, a large fraction, 90 to 95% of resonant chain systems go unstable, but a few, you know, a, a small fraction, maybe a few percent don't. In that case, we can match the, uh, the period ratio distribution in it. it. It also matches some other things about the, the properties of super Earths as well. And so this is a nice story. It matches pretty well. It kind of predicts that most system, most super Earth systems went through this phase of resonant chains, but only a small fraction survive. And those surviving ones are some of the coolest systems we got. For example, the most dramatic system of this kind is the, is the TRAPPIST-1 system of seven, you know, very roughly Earth-sized planets all in a resonant chain. And the resonant chain is characterized really well for all seven planets. It's pretty cool. So, oh, do you have a question? Ah, so where does the snow line fall after the migration? Yeah. So the snow line is still farther out there somewhere. And so, so kind of the a key thing is a lot of these plants that end up close in may have formed out by the, or even past the snow line. And so their compositions in the end may reflect a very different part of the disk. All right, so now let's go back to our overarching picture view and take So in this system, the, I mean, what, what's frustrating from a certain point of view about, uh, about comparing this to observations is the, the compositions of these plants are not really known, right? The, oh, nebular gas. No, the, the gas disks are gone. Yeah. So, so most of the time, the resonances are destroyed. And if you look in more detail, the resonances that are preserved are those that are just a little bit uh, less compact. So resonances that are more like three to two, 
or two to one are less likely to explode than ones that are more compact where the planets are on four to three or six to five kind of resonances because their orbits are closer together. And so that a smaller kick is needed for them to go unstable. And so it's possible to explain, you know, to, to try to make predictions based on that, but it's kind of premature to really predict concrete things. So let me move on to, to a different branch where gas giant plants may form. So uh, there's different models for how gas giant plants form. Kind of the most popular one, maybe not a DTM, but the most popular one uh, these days is the, is the core accretion model, the idea that, that planets may form cores and then pile a bunch of gas on top of them. And in terms of, uh, of when, once large cores grow, they have an interesting effect on the growth of other plants in their system. What they can do is if there's a flux of pebbles drifting by through the disk, a large enough planets can, can block them. So anything above about 20 Earth mass is, you know, for a typical disk model. So, so as shown in this plot here is the perturbations to the density in the gas disk made by this one planet. There's one planet here that's 20 Earth masses. The star, you know, the star is down here. And we're seeing, looking the distance away from the, uh, the star, and this is the azimuthal direction. And there are perturbations to the gas disk. So there's a little, you know, it's not a real gap cleared out here, but there's a little uh, density deficit. And the key, fa uh, key thing here is this perturbation here. This is a, a, a perturbation particularly to the pressure in the gas, such that pebbles, like this pebble that's drifting inward from further out, can't make it onto the planet. It can't make it past the planet. It gets trapped. It gets trapped right there. It gets stuck in that density perturbation. And that kind of process is called the pebble isolation. And, and it matters because anything that's closer in than that planet gets starved by this process. So it can't, they can't grow by accreting pebbles. They can still grow by eating each other, but they can't grow by eating pebbles anymore. And so in the solar system, we think that Jupiter's core may have done this by blocking the inward flux of pebbles. So in our kind of cartoon disk view here, once Jupiter's core, or a large core anyway, grew big enough, it would have blocked the inward flux of pebbles. And from that point onward, anything closer to the sun could still grow by accreting other planetesimals, but not pebbles. And there may be evidence for this in the meteorite record. Uh, there's two different types of meteorites. So, so what we're looking at here is the, basically the time after CAI formation, time from time zero of planet formation. And these blue and red bars are the distributions of ages of different types of meteorites. The, there's basically two isotopically distinct categories of meteorites, the carbonaceous and non-carbonaceous meteorites. And the key thing is that they have a lot of overlap in their ages. And the constituents of these meteorites are the perfect size to drift really fast within the disk. And so the fact that these two meteorites look so, two populations of meteorites look so different seems to indicate that they were kept spatially separate. And so what could have done that one interpretation, this part here is really interpretation from that. One interpretation is that Jupiter's core may have formed fast enough to block the influx of pebbles that were presumably carbonaceous pebbles into the inner solar system, keeping the inner solar system dominated by non-carbonaceous and the outer solar system bicarbonaceous. And so this kind of pebble isolation may have happened in the solar system. As Jupiter got bigger, or as Jupiter-like planets get bigger, they, there's another effect that kind of affects their system, which is they can block the migration of bigger objects too. And so let's say in this cartoon, say this guy becomes a Jupiter-like planet. It tends to carve an annular gap in the disk, and then it tends to block the migration of more distant embryos. So just in case you know, these outer objects became big enough to migrate inward to try to become super-Earths, their inward migration would be blocked by the gas giant. And this makes a nice, simple prediction that any time a Jupiter forms, you should, at least most of the time, not end up with super-Earths. And so wide orbit Jupiters should anti-correlate with the presence of you know, lots of uh, super Earths. And so this is right at the edge of what can be tested right now. So let's, let's uh, see. There's actually three studies about this right now. So one of them goes in the right direction of this prediction. There's, for Barbado et al. found a deficit of super Earths in systems where they already had 
known wide orbit giants. Uh, Brian et al. found the opposite. They found an excess of Jupiter-like trends when they selected for systems that have super. And that's basically the same thing as Zhu and Wu. And so being, not being an observer, this just feels like it's not quite figured out yet to me. Yeah. That's a kind of a complication in that sometimes maybe it's not the closest in migrating object that becomes Jupiter. Maybe there's other ones that could form closer in. So that would just make the trend. In that case, you should still have a trend, but it wouldn't be a, a binary thing. So, so I think this is unresolved, but it's an interesting way to kind of test this, this model that should be doable in the coming few years, I think. All right, now let's move on to the, to the most exciting system of all, our own solar system. So let's take this branch up here to solar system-like systems. And if you're going to go to solar system-like systems, you may as well go to the, the actual solar system. So what do we got? What are we trying to match with models for solar system formation? Well, this is the inner solar system. And you know, we got our four terrestrial planets, we got a few asteroids in there, and, and Jupiter. Um, and in terms of total amount of mass, the terrestrial planets only have a total of a couple Earth masses. The asteroid belt you know, added all up, and it only has less than a thousandth of an Earth mass, not a lot of stuff. But there is you know, it's a lot of interesting structure in there. So this is showing the, the distribution of many different types of asteroids within the belt. It's, it's much simpler to just kind of consider that the inner belt is dominated by certain types and the outer belt by others, but in reality, it's pretty complicated. And so, so in terms of constraints, if you want to have a specific things to match with a formation model, uh, then what you'd want to match are things like the properties of the terrestrial planets, their numbers and masses, uh, growth time scales, uh, you know, the properties of the asteroid belt as well. And so this kind of, this kind of study was pioneered by by George Wetherill and John Chambers, really. And so, so the kind of standard model that came out of that, that type of thinking is the classical model. This is kind of a simple, planets grow relatively, you know, simply from a bottom-up way where they are. And the key assumption in the classical model is that the growth of the giant planets can be separated from the growth of the terrestrial planets. And so we can assume that our starting conditions, so time zero here, is not when CAI is formed, it's when the gas disk disappeared, so Jupiter's growth was completed. And so here's just kind of a, a simple simulation of a bunch of you know, large, uh, small planetary embryos, basically, that are going to collide and grow. And so, so let's, let's see that in action. The color here corresponds to the water content. And so you can see the mixing of, you know, between different radial zones as, as colors change. And so you can see there's kind of a wave of growth that sweeps outward pretty quickly. This guy here becomes a pretty good Earth analog in this simulation. And you can see it still doesn't have any water, but it, it will in a few minutes. And so there, its color change. That's just basically showing radial mixing between different zones that presumably have different composition. And on a 50 or 100 million year time scale, there's kind of a sweep up of the final leftovers of planet formation. And in this simulation, there's three terrestrial planets that formed. There's pretty good Venus and Earth analog in there. Uh, there's a really, really bad Mars analog here. And then there's kind of a bunch of leftover junk that you can squint at and call the asteroid belt. So, so this kind of model works really well to, to match certain aspects of the solar system, but not everything. The key problem with this model, which was actually pointed out by George Wetherill back in the early 90s, is the Mars problem. This, this classical model systematically forms planets that are all usually about the same size. And so the fact that in real life, Mars is about nine times more massive than, or sorry, Earth is nine times more massive than Mars is really hard to match in this kind of simple model. They instead of forming Marses that are much smaller than Earth's, they tend to form Marses that are about the same size. And that's not the real solar system. So to date, there are kind of three possible solutions to this problem. And I'll go through each one. They're, they're called the low mass asteroid belt, grand tack, and early instability models. So Let's just go through these. The low mass asteroid belt model makes a, a key assumption, which was that there was very little stuff in between the terrestrial planet, plants and the, where the giant planets were forming to start off. There was never any much in the way of planetesimals or planetary embryos there. So that, that seems kind of weird, right? This is just a, a weird assumption to make. Why would you ever think that? Well, let me just explain why it might not be completely crazy anyway. 
So we think that at least early on, uh, there should have been a smooth distribution of dust and gas in, in, any, you know, in any disk, just because things are spread out there. But when we look at disks around young stars, they don't look all nice and smooth like that. Right? As you guys have seen, probably, from, from ALMA images, rings uh, are very common uh, in, uh, in young disks. And so this is the most famous one, the first one, HL Tau. And so it, there's a debate as to whether these images indicate that you know, there's already planets in the disk that are forming these gaps or not. Uh, the gaps here are basically deficits in dust of a certain size. Uh, so, so there's a debate whether, as to whether there's already planets here or not. But what's really clear and not debated is that these rings are enhancements in the density of dust. And when there's enough of an enhancement in the density of dust, that's when planetesimals can form. And so it's easy to imagine maybe you know, these enhancements in dust happen without planets having already formed. And they create rings of planetesimals where planets can form. And some models that try to incorporate you know, evolving disks and dust drifting around do end up forming rings of planetesimals. This is a model where they form just one large dense ring of planetesimals around 1 AU. Right? In this model, they did not form another ring out where the giant planets should be forming. But they do form some rings of planetesimals. So that's kind of the very simple justification for the initial conditions of this model, which are admittedly kind of suspect. But that's the, that's the assumption. And if, if you go with that assumption, then, then what happens? Well, you know, you start with this, and the terrestrial planets are forming here. And what happens is Mercury, or sorry, Venus and Earth are big because they formed within this kind of ring of planetesimals. And Mars is small because it was kicked out. And so it was kicked out relatively early and starved. And that's why Mars is much smaller than Earth. And again, if you can accept the assumptions of this model, it, it works surprisingly well. It does, but not as far in as you might think. Yeah, it depends. So exactly how far it would deplete, it depends on its migration history, and that is really up for grabs. The, the act of growing the giant, you know, growing the, uh, the gas accretion part also depletes a certain region as well. Yeah, was there another question? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's totally plausible that it's just the disk doing things like uh, streaming instability, which is very sensitive, you know, is very sensitive to the local uh, dust to gas ratio. So if there's a little enhancement, it can kind of have a feedback where you can end up depleting the region outside of it and enhancing right there. It's, it's, I think the initial conditions are, are plausible, you know, in that, in that kind of way of thinking. Could it deplete the dust? Uh, I mean, it should block any dust that wants to drift in from further out. Could it deplete the dust? It would dynamically deplete dust within a given region, but the dust is so strongly coupled to the gas that as soon as you're at the edge of its actual gap in the gas disk, I don't think it could deplete it in interior to there. And there's an interesting, um, just moving on, in terms of the asteroid belt in this model, you know, even if the asteroid belt starts off pretty much empty, it still ends up getting refilled. So we don't have to worry about the idea that the asteroid belt would stay empty. And that's just because anytime there's a void, things get filled up. So, so for example, Jupiter's growth out here naturally scatters a whole bunch of stuff all over the place, local planetesimals that are nearby enough to get destabilized as its mass increases and it becomes a real gas giant. They get scattered all over the place. Since there's still gas there, gas drag can act to trap a fraction of those objects within the belt. And maybe some even go past the belt to the terrestrial planets. And a slightly less efficient process, but one that still happens also, is as the terrestrial planets are forming, they kick things outward as well. And some fraction of those uh, objects are trapped on stable orbits within the terrestrial planet region as well. And it's been proposed that things like iron meteorite, you know, parent bodies, or even uh, things like Vesta may have originated in the terrestrial planet forming zone. 
So that's the low mass asteroid belt model. The Grand Tack model is kind of the most well known of these models because it's been around for the longest. It's built on the idea that Mars's feeding zone was depleted by Jupiter's migration rather than by uh, things like the streaming instability. And so the idea, kind of the very simple idea goes that as Jupiter was growing, we're looking at its orbital distance as a function of time, you know, we can make simple arguments as to the given trajectory it may have taken. We think it was growing exactly how it was migrating as a core is up for grabs. As soon as it, as soon as it became large enough to carve a gap in the disk, it probably went inward and would have just kept going inward indefinitely if it weren't for Saturn that was doing the same thing a bit further away. As Saturn reached a critical mass, it migrated inward, probably was trapped in resonance with Jupiter. And then there's a neat hydrodynamical effect that takes them both outward. And this hydrodynamical effect only works when they're trapped in the right resonance, three to two or two to one, and have the right mass ratio of about two to four. But if those conditions are met and are maintained, then their outward migration can go for a long time, presumably until the gas disk started to dissipate and they were stranded on their, you know, near their current orbits. So that's kind of the, the framework of the Grand Tack model. And if this kind of evolution happened and Jupiter's turnaround point was around one and a half or two AU, then it would have had a strong effect on terrestrial planet formation. So this is a, a simulation of rocky stuff forming. And what we'll see is these are, you know, planetary embryos and planetesimals. And Jupiter's gonna come in and start from a disk and turn that disk into a ring, basically. So starting from a disk, Jupiter migrating inward then outward creates this ring of planetesimals that's similar to the initial conditions for the other model and can explain why since Mars got kicked out here, I think that's is the Mars analog in the simulation, uh, it's starved while Earth and Venus can grow big within this ring that has a lot more mass. All right, the final model that I'll mention, oh, sorry. Oh yeah, so, so, so I just showed the early animation. There's one that goes for longer and it's, it's eccentricity on longer time scales gets damped by a few planetesimals that go by. But it's not, I mean, it's not the greatest analog ever, but statistically speaking, it works pretty well. Yeah, you're right though, it's way, it's, it's way too eccentric there. So this guy's gotta get damped quite a bit to be, to be viable. Uh, the last model I'll mention is, uh, is the early instability model. It's developed by Matt Clement right there. Uh, and it's built on the idea that there was an instability in the solar system that's commonly referred to as the Nice model instability. And the instability, uh, I, you guys are probably aware of this, but I'll just go through it really quickly. The idea is that we think that giant planets may have formed on much more, in a more compact configuration with an outer disk of leftover planetesimals, kind of a primordial Kuiper belt that was much more massive that was maybe 10 to 50 Earth masses in total. And interactions between the plants and maybe the disk caused the system to go unstable and spread out, and, and it can explain a lot of different aspects of the solar system. And so here's kind of the cartoon version of it. Uh, the instability is triggered at time zero here. In this case, there was an extra ice giant that was ejected, and the final system of four planets matches their current orbital eccentricities and orbital spacing. And it can explain a lot of different aspects of the small body populations of the solar system. So this model, the, the idea that this instability happened is really quite accepted. But what has been recently challenged is the timing. And so it used to be thought that this instability had to happen late to coincide with the late heavy bombardment. But recent analyses suggest that maybe there was no late heavy bombardment. So an early instability is probably favored. Probably anything in the first 100 million years is much more likely than a late instability. And so you might ask, well, if there was a very early instability, what would the effect be on the forming, you know, the, the growing terrestrial planets? And this is what Matt has studied. And so here are just some snapshots from a simulation, uh, showing snapshots in time of a full system going from very close to the sun all the way out to the giant planet region. And what you can see is, you know, starting at time zero, things are nice and calm. Then when the instability in the giant planets is triggered, you can see there's three ice giants at the start, one of which is, is ejected. The asteroid belt region and Mars's feeding zone are really strongly perturbed and depleted. And the final systems that form have really large mass ratios between you know, the outermost big planet, the Earth analog, and the Mars analog. 
And so this model is able to deplete Mars's feeding zone and excite the asteroid belt in a way that's consistent with the present day solar system and basically offers a possible solution to the, uh, to the small Mars problem. So going back to these three possible small Mars problem solutions, they each have possible Achilles heels also that I sort of alluded to. The, the problem or the potential problem for the low mass asteroid belt is really the initial conditions. Does it make sense in the context of what's really going on in a full disk for narrow rings to form? And in a hand wavy way, probably, but it hasn't really been demonstrated. Uh, the Grand TAC model, uh, its potential Achilles heel is really the outward migration mechanism. There are certain conditions that are required to maintain that migration. The key one is that Jupiter has to be about three times more massive than Saturn. And if the gas is causing them to migrate, they should also be accreting gas. So if Saturn accretes too much gas, then it can mess up the mass ratio and cause them to stop doing that. And so it, no one's really modeled all of that at once in a, in a way that's believable yet. So we'll see. And for the early instability model, the key thing is when did the instability actually happen? If it happens too late, then it's too late to affect the formation of the terrestrial planets. But if it happened early, then it makes a lot of sense that it did. So, so just to, to move on to the last little branch in our story, let's go down to, to Jupiter-like planets on non-Jupiter-like orbits. So the distribution of giant exoplanets in terms of their orbital eccentricities and uh, semi-major axes uh, looks like this. And you can see the kind of key thing is there's a lot of planets with very eccentric orbits. And we think that there's two key processes that are shaping this diagram, one of them being orbital migration of planets that go inward, and the other one being scattering. So what is scattering? Well, the idea is that planets probably don't form by themselves. Anytime there's enough mass to form one giant planet, there's probably enough mass to form two or three. And then this kind of thing can happen. So here's a simulation uh, by Eric Ford of a three-planet system where over time, the orbits of the last, the, the outer two planets have become kind of stretched out such that they cross. And that doesn't mean that they're going to collide. Instead, they have this series of gravitational encounters whereby, boom, you can see there's an energy exchange such that one of the planets got enough orbital energy to go away and never come back. It's ejected into interstellar space. And the surviving planet has this stretched out orbit, this eccentric orbit as kind of a scar from its violent past. And so, so that's the planet-planet scattering model. And you might wonder what that would do to terrestrial planets. And so, so here's a kind of simulation like the one I showed you before, except instead of just Jupiter or Jupiter and Saturn, there's Jupiter and two Saturn. Right? And there's a bunch of leftover planetesimals out here. And these guys are you know, rocky planetary embryos that are bashing together to form terrestrial planets. And at this point, they're already you know, half the size of the Earth. And then the movie slowing down for some reason, because boom. So that's an instability. That's planet-planet scattering. And what happened is the giant planets went unstable. All that nice rocky stuff got dumped onto the star. And all these outer icy planetesimals got ejected. And so we turned a system that looked a lot like the solar system in terms of having very low eccentricity giant planets into one that looks a lot more like a lot of giant exoplanet systems with large eccentricities and destroyed all the, the nice rocky stuff in the process. And so the, a, a tiny little diversion on this is you can think about the objects that are, that are ejected, because these things that are ejected into interstellar space, sometimes, you know, you, in general, in these simulations, once they're ejected, you never think about them again. But these days, people are thinking about them. And so why is that? It's because there's two now interstellar objects that have been found passing through the solar system. So the first one was Oumuamua, and this is its trajectory here. The second one's called Borisov, which was just found a couple months ago. And I have a few more slides going into detail on that, but I feel like I should probably stop there. So if you guys have questions about that, I'm happy to answer them, but otherwise I'll, I'll stop there. Right. So thanks. Oh yeah, you want to hear about the, these guys? I mean, sure. So I was gonna, I was gonna go in, into detail about if you kind of follow the, the thinking that they might be ejected planetesimals, then the kind of simulation that I showed before, like this one, you can look at it in more detail to try to figure out if there's any processes that are missing here 
that could be important. And so the key thing is, there's a couple of key things. All right, I'll, I'll just go. So, you know, how do things get ejected? Uh, they don't tend to go close to a giant planet once and get chucked out. It, they need a lot of encounters, you know, typically. So it's typically tens to hundreds. And so anytime a planetesimal here goes close to a giant planet, it gets scattered, its orbit changes a little bit, but it keeps coming back. You know, it just keeps happening until finally it's ejected. And what these encounters look like, if you, if you look at the details, if you kind of say this, this gray region is the hill sphere where the gravity of the planet dominates the gravity of the sun, so you can change the orbital energy, there's this kind of interesting little zone right near the planet where if anything goes in there, something interesting is going to happen, this tidal disruption radius. So most encounters are just slight deflections like that or maybe a slightly stronger kick or sometimes there's collisions. But once in a while, you know, a, a planetesimal can pass really close to a planet but not so close that it's actually going to collide. And then you would expect something like it to get torn into pieces. And this is the same thing that happened to, to shoemaker levy uh, when it passed too close to Jupiter. And so we have you know, examples of this happening in the solar system. And you can try to apply simple criteria for tidal disruption to simulations to figure out you know, what fraction of the time that should be happening. Uh, and, and I won't go through the details of this. You can do calculations and compare it to exoplanets and stuff. And I'll just give you the punchline. It's about 1% of the time. So about 1% of things that are ejected seem to be passed close enough to a giant planet that they should be torn to pieces before they're ejected. And so depending on parameters that we don't really know related to size distributions, fragments like that, tidal disruption fragments, might end up dominating the population of, of things that are kicked out. And so that's kind of one key, key piece of the story. And, and there's another one too, but I, I clearly put in way too many slides. So I, I, I can just stop there. That's kind of one ingredient that's it's kind of an interesting thing to, to think about. Yeah. yeah. So, typically, in order to have normal capacity to gather the planet, the habitable planet is going to have Oh, that would be bad. <laughs> that'd, be, <laughs> that'd be really, really bad. <laughs> yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> So, all right, so for our solar system, the key things that the NIST model can explain are these, you know, the, the really nice ones are the small body populations, like the inclination distribution of Jupiter's Trojans, irregular satellite properties. It can explain the Kuiper belt pretty well. And also the spacing of the planets, but I'm not sure that's really required. So, so if you want to think about, you know, what can other solar systems or other planetary systems tell us about this, um, the key thing, we already know that instabilities are really common from the giant, you know, the, the, the eccentricity distribution of giant planets. But even in there, our solar system's instability would be kind of, you know, a really wimpy case, right? Jupiter and Saturn never scattered off each other because in that case, we wouldn't be here. But we think that Jupiter had to eject an ice giant, you know, to, to, to spread things out a little bit. And so the key thing that you might be able to test with exoplanet systems is the timing. And there's good, I think there's a good argument to be made that the timing of instabilities should be early. And everyone who is not involved in the, the Nice model initially was kind of skeptical of the timing from the start. Because it's really hard to have an instability that happens late. It's not impossible, right? It, it happens. And like the movie I showed you of planet scattering was like a one in 100 kind of thing where the instability happens late enough that when I'm explaining it, I can tell enough of the story before things go nuts, right? So you choose which ones to make movies of. And so it, it can happen, but it's really in the tail of the, of the distribution. At least you know, from a dynamics point of view, the only natural trigger for these instabilities is the gas just going away. And then there's some time for things to get going and go unstable. And so I would think that instability should be early. And maybe that's something we can test by looking at other systems. And exactly how you would do that is not the simplest thing. Ideally, you'd have a distribution of different ages, say an eccentricity distribution as a function of age, but that's not easy to do. 
maybe something related to dust properties that are kind of you know, tracers of instability or tracers of the dynamics of the systems as a function of age, something like that. So hopefully in the coming years, you can get a, you know, make it a handle on, on the timing aspect of it. Uh, or... mm -hmm. I mean, the small Mars problem, it was, it was first pointed out by, by George Wetherill, and it's something I've worked on a lot, so I thought it was, it was perfect for this audience. <laughs> no, but, but for real, it's, it's, a very, it's a very strange thing, because you know, from a very conceptual point of view, planets that form have kind of similar sizes if they form from a smooth disk. Systems of super-Earths tend to have similar sizes within a given system. And so it's a relatively kind of generic problem applied to the solar system. I don't think it's the only problem in the solar system. But it's, uh, it's one way to kind of frame uh, how models can fit in. There's, there's other ways to frame it. People who work more on migration would probably focus on, on Jupiter. Just how you could end up with a planet that's Jupiter mass that's on a wide enough orbit is really tricky from a theoretical point of view, at least right now. Because migration models tend to go really far inward. And so most migration models that include kind of growth by pebble accretion and migration and then gas accretion all at the same time can, can form planets that look just like Jupiter as long as their cores started off at 20 AU. And then that works, but it's not satisfying because they can't explain what happened to everything interior to 20 AU. And, and so the whole story still doesn't fit together. So, so the small Mars problem is one way to kind of zoom in on the, on the inner solar system and to frame the discussion, but it's not the only problem. Yeah, I mean, the only paper that's really gone in, into the guts of that that I'm aware of is by, by Matt Clements and John Chambers. It's a very tricky one because it's an even bigger problem because for two reasons. The mass ratio is even worse, and the, the dynamical separation is even farther in terms of, say, orbital period ratio uh, between Mercury and Venus. And so that's a, that's a tricky one. It, I mean, in the, con in the bigger context of you know, exoplanet systems explaining why you know, why we don't have anything, any big planets closer in than, than Venus is weird. And the detailed properties of Mercury also. So that's an open problem, I think. That's what we were arguing. I, Yeah, or have some kind of signature of disruption, yeah. Yeah, so, so exactly whether, <laughs> sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, so, so there's more to the, the rest of the story. I'll, I'll, I'll zoom through this part. There's, we argued that there's this other effect of extinction before uh, ejection. And so, so within this kind of context, you know, if things, if these two processes are important, for, you know, tidal disruption and, and this other extinction effect, then you can explain both of them and, and in kind of a one general framework. But exactly the weight of different outcomes is really tricky because we don't have things like size distributions of these things or even a proper shape for, for Oumuamua. Um, not, it's a, that's a tricky one, yeah. If the late veneer, I don't know what's the latest on that. Is the late veneer has to be all encitite and very little carbonaceous chondrite, or, or is it? Okay, so if that's, if we accept that, if, if the late veneer has to be, you know, cannot be carbonaceous chondrite-like, then something like the Grand Tac could plausibly work if the whole inward and outward migration thing happened early enough 
that all that scattered stuff was cleared out or accreted fast. So that there's still a kind of a tail of accretion of leftovers that are coming from close in rather than farther out. It's not fully satisfying, and it might require rethinking of exactly the, the migration and growth of Jupiter and Saturn aspect. It's, uh, it's much simpler from a dynamical point of view if the late veneer has a, at least a, a carbonaceous chondrite component. But if that's not the case, it's kind of more interesting because then you got to really go and see whether these models hold up. Ah, the, the dichotomy between uh, super-Earths and mini-Neptunes? That's an interesting one. I mean, uh, so, so it depends on the interpretation of that, uh, you know, the, the radius gap or the Fulton gap of, uh, the, you know, the size distribution of super-Earths. And so kind of the most accepted view is that, that photo evaporation idea, that there's kind of a common population and, you know, there's this gap that gets carved by, by objects who, who lose their atmospheres really efficiently. And in that case, you know, then you wouldn't have any of these, you know, they, you'd have similar objects, but ones that just hold onto their atmospheres further out. Um, I, I'm not sure about the interpretation of that. I know there's alternate models for explaining that. Uh, there's one by, by Zhang et al., for example, who proposed that the larger objects are actually really water rich rather than gas rich. Sorry, say that again? Oh, okay. I mean, wh why would you have systems with many small super-Earths that never merge into a big one? Ah, I mean, things like uh, the timing of when they form can affect us in terms of the density of the gas as they're, as they're migrating. Basically, the, 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 you know, the denser the disk at the, during the migration phase and the more compaction there is and the tendency to, is to form a few, you know, a smaller number of planets that are more massive. And so depending on the timing, if things form a little more slowly, then systems can end up being a little bit more widely spaced and not converge into one or two big guys. Does that answer? All right, cool. Cool. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thanks, everyone. <laughs>